In this video, we look at what's inside a router, including buffering, queue drop policies, scheduling, switching fabrics, forwarding, and packet scheduling. Let's get started. In this video, we get to start digging into the details of the network layer, specifically looking at how routers work. Routers are built of a number of components, including the input and output ports, their associated buffers, and the switching fabric that connects them. We will use this abstraction to discuss the functionality of routers. Packets proceed through the ports following the direction of the arrows, and there's a high-speed switching fabric connecting the input and output ports together. Note that physically, a port on a router is most likely both an input and output port. But for understanding the logic of their operations, we'll discuss input ports separately from output ports. As mentioned in the last video, there's also a routing processor, which handles the control plane functionality of a traditional router. The routing processor provides information to each of the input ports so that forwarding decisions may be made appropriately. So this routing processor performs the routing functions and management for the device. If you connect to a router and configure it, you're interacting with the routing processor. This processor is relatively slow compared to other parts of the router and does not directly interact with the traffic passing through it. The data plane, on the other hand, must be able to keep up with the rate at which packets arrive and need to be forwarded. So this means the hardware must operate several orders of magnitude faster than the control plane. And this is where most of the expense exists in developing carrier grade routers. You'll note that we have several boxes within each of the input and output ports. So now let's break down the functions of the ports in more detail. First, we have a physical interface with the line itself. This could be an interface with copper twisted pair or fiber or even coaxial. We'll leave more details of that discussion for the link and physical layer content that comes later in the book. The next function is the link layer behavior. This may perform error checking or correction, encoding, media access control, etc. All topics of discussion for chapter six. Once those decapsulations have happened, we're left with an IP packet that arrives at the interface needing forwarding and queuing. In order for the correct forwarding decision to be made, the interface needs to perform a lookup. This lookup involves checking the forwarding table that is provided by the routing processor in order to determine what output port the packet needs to be forwarded to. Ideally, all of this functionality must be completed at line speed, meaning as fast as the packets can possibly arrive at the input port, they need to be processed and handed off to the switching fabric. If the switching fabric is not able to handle all of the input ports running at line speed all at once, there will need to be input queuing. But input queuing is not desirable for reasons we will see later. So in a high-end router, the switching fabric will be able to keep up with all of the input ports running at full speed all the time. Traditional IP forwarding is based on looking at the destination IP address only, and traditional routing hardware is optimized around this destination-based forwarding. It is also possible to perform generalized forwarding based on any of the header fields, and when we discuss software-defined networking, we'll see more examples of this behavior. For now, we'll focus on destination-based forwarding because that is the traditional IP behavior. In this example, we have taken ranges of IP addresses and written the ranges out in their binary form using the starting and ending addresses. We will note that the prefixes of all of these addresses are the same, meaning the leftmost 19 bits of all of these are the same. So each of the ranges in the table has an identified output interface through which arriving datagrams should be forwarded. We also have a default. So if any of the datagrams arriving don't fall into one of these ranges, they will have somewhere to go as well. Unfortunately, in the real world, it's almost never quite this neat and tidy. The ranges will get broken up and their purposes changed over time. And so you start to have subsets of ranges that need to go here or there and not to the original interface. In this case, we're seeing that a subset of the first range actually needs to go to port three instead of port zero. As humans, this is fairly easy to grasp. However, from a programmatic standpoint, the same datagram technically matches both of these first two ranges. So how is the router to know whether it should go to port zero or port three? Routers use what's called longest prefix matching. So when the router matches the destination address from the datagram with its table, it will use the prefix with the most matching bits. So in this example, we show our prefixes, again written out in binary, and bits which can match any value are replaced with stars. So we can see that the second and third prefixes are the same up to the 21st bit. Then the second prefix is longer in that it specifies three zeros, the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th bit. So if a datagram comes in with a destination address that has zeros in those three positions, it technically matches both the second and the third prefixes. But because of the longest prefix matching rule, the router will forward it based on the second prefix, not the third prefix. In these two examples, we can see the first datagram destination address is only a match for the first prefix. So it will be forwarded out interface zero. 
the second example destination address is a match for both the second and the third prefix. But as we just mentioned, because the second prefix is the longer one, that is the one that will be used to make the forwarding decision. So the second example will, will be forwarded out interface one. Note that for the bits that are specified in the prefixes, they must match exactly. We're not doing a closest match or similarity match or anything like that. The prefix must be an exact match. In the second case, we see how it matches the third prefix as well as the second prefix. And so the length of the prefix will be the determining factor. We'll keep coming back to this idea of longest prefix matching as we learn more about IP addressing. One of the advantages of longest prefix matching is that it can be performed very quickly in hardware. Recall that we need to be able to make forwarding decisions about incoming packets as fast as they arrive. So this is an important consideration. One specification to keep in mind when looking at routers is the number of forwarding table entries they can hold in their TCAM. The TCAM is a content addressable memory, which is very expensive because of its high speed. So these tend to be small, and if they're too small to hold the number of forwarding table entries needed, then the router will not function as expected. Now that we've seen the components of an input port, we can move on to discussing switching fabrics. The job of the switching fabric is to transfer a packet from the input port to the output port. One of the most important specifications of the switching fabric is its switching speed. And we typically look at the speed as a function of the line rates of the ports in question. If we have n input ports, each with rate r, then the ideal switching rate of the fabric is n times r. This would mean that it can accept packets from all of the input ports as fast as they can arrive. There are three major types of switching fabrics we're likely to see in routers. These include a shared memory switching fabric, a bus type switching fabric, and a crossbar interconnection network. Early routers, as well as many inexpensive routers today, were architected like general purpose computers, and this meant they used a shared memory approach to switching packets. The packet would arrive on the input port, be copied into the system memory, the CPU would make the forwarding decision, and send it back out the appropriate interface. This means that each packet must cross the memory bus twice, and the overall system is limited by the I.O. bandwidth of the memory. And we can see an example of that here, with the packets coming in, being copied into memory, and then forwarded out based on the CPU's forwarding decision. An alternative to this is to do switching via a bus, where the packets are not copied to an intermediate memory, but forwarded directly across from input to output. To do this successfully, the bus must run very fast, as we mentioned ideally, n times the line rate of each of the input ports. As an example, a Cisco 5600 series router uses a 32 gigabit per second bus. The high speed components of the bus can be quite expensive, as well as using significant amounts of power and generating significant amounts of heat. Because the bus is a shared architecture, only one packet may be traversing the bus at any given time. And this is why the bus must run so fast to keep up with the input ports. There are a number of different types of interconnection networks, but the fundamental difference between these and a bus is that multiple packets may be traversing the crossbar at a given point in time. So while the crossbar fabric is more complex than a bus, it doesn't have to run at as high clock speed to achieve equivalent throughput. One example of these is the crossbar, which is shown, or a multi-stage switch, which is essentially building up larger port counts by wiring together many two-port switches. But in either case, these are able to use parallelism. One of the features that may be employed in these networks is to break the datagram up into smaller cells. These can then be rapidly switched through the network without blocking other packets for more significant lengths of time. This fragmentation is not part of the IP protocol, however, it would be done as a proprietary means within a particular switch architecture. Here's an example of such fragmentation. Additional parallelism is possible by using multiple of the switching planes in parallel. For example, in a Cisco CRS router, the basic unit includes eight parallel switching planes, each with three stages, but this can support up to hundreds of terabits per second of switching capacity. Now let's go back and revisit something I mentioned a few slides ago, which is that input port queuing is not desirable. Let's see why. If the switching fabric is not as fast as the n times r ideal rate, then the input ports will be forced to hold onto packets while additional packets arrive. This means that there must be a queue at the input port in which to store these packets. An example of this is when two input ports need to forward packets to the same output port, but the switching fabric can only handle one of these at a time, and so the other must queue at the input port. When this happens, it leads to a case of head of line blocking. In this example, the top red packet was switched first, meaning that not only the bottom red packet had to wait, but the green packet behind it also had to wait. However, we note that the green output port is idle. Had the switching fabric been faster and been able to switch both of the red packets, 
Yes, one of the red packets would have needed to queue at the output port, but the green packet could have been switched in the next cycle instead of being delayed. To avoid the head-of-line blocking problem, output queuing is far more desirable than input queuing. We will still have to queue somewhere because of the case where multiple packets might get switched to the same output port faster than it has bandwidth available. When the packets arrive at a rate faster than the output port can service and exceed the size of the queue, they will be dropped due to the congestion, and it will be up to the transport layer to determine any retransmission actions needed. When a buffer is overflowing, it is up to the router implementation and configuration to determine which packets to drop. Certainly a tail drop queue is the most common, meaning the last packet arriving to a full queue is the one that gets dropped. However, other priority scheduling is certainly possible, which could prioritize some classes of traffic over others. This is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to matters of network neutrality. Let's look at an example with output port queuing. We'll assume that our input and output ports have the same transmission rates. So we can see that on the left, we have multiple packets arriving for the red output port. So clearly some of these will need to be buffered while the output port sends them one at a time. But at least by using output port queuing, we're not holding up packets on the input side as they wait behind red packets. So aside from the queue drop policy, another consideration is how large should these buffers be? Not surprisingly, there is an RFC recommendation on this, and it says that the buffer size should be roughly the RTT times the link capacity, which would be an approximation for a bandwidth delay product. For high capacity links, this would indicate reasonably large buffers, such as the example here with a 10 gigabit per second link using a 2.5 gigabit buffer. If it to get bytes from this, we would divide by eight. There's an implicit assumption in this calculation that the queue is dominated by a single flow. However, in the core of the network, this is generally not the case. So more recent recommendations take the number of flows into account, recognizing that with more statistical multiplexing between flows, less buffering is needed. It's quite important to note that too much buffering is a bad thing. We've already talked about how TCP interacts with buffers. TCP doesn't back off until it loses packets, and congestion won't induce lost packets until the queue is full. So the inference here is that TCP will always keep the queues full at bottleneck links. The bigger the queue is, the higher the queuing delay will be. So we want the queue to be just big enough to handle bursts of arriving packets and keep the output link fully utilized, but no more. Any excess buffering will just increase our queuing delay. If you want to know more about this, Google the term buffer bloat. So back to our output link, which consists of the buffer, the link layer protocol, layer two, and the physical line connection. So basically the mirror image of the input link. The link layer protocol will determine the rate at which datagrams can be transmitted. So if we want to relate this to queuing theory, the link layer protocol is the server servicing our queue. A buffer management scheme may indicate a tail drop queue, which is the most common option, or a priority queue where low priority packets are dropped first before high priority packets, regardless of the order in which they arrive. This is also the point at which any marking for congestion control interaction would happen. If you recall in the discussion of TCP congestion control, we mentioned the ECN mechanism where bits are set in the IP header to indicate that congestion is experienced. So that would happen as part of the buffer management at our output queue. We've talked about when to drop packets, meaning tail drop versus priority queuing, we can also talk about when to send packets. The type of queue we normally think about is the FIFO queue, first in, first out, or first come, first served. But this is certainly not the only option. We could also separate packets by priority and send the high priority packets first, even if they arrived later. We could use a round robin approach with multiple classes of traffic, or we could use a weighted fair queuing approach with multiple classes of traffic. It's important to understand these mechanisms for networks which provide differentiated services. I typically refer to FIFO queues as opposed to FCFS, but that's personal preference. Most of the queues we're familiar with dealing with in the real world fall into this category. For example, lines at the bank or the supermarket. Priority scheduling is where the arriving traffic is first sorted by class into multiple queues. This is more like lines at the airport where some queues get serviced before others, even if the occupants arrive later. Note that we're not specifying how this priority is determined. Any of the header fields are fair game for determining traffic priority. With pure priority queuing, packets are always sent from the highest priority queue that has buffered packets. But within a given priority, packets are handled in a FIFO manner. We note that in pure priority queuing, starvation is a problem, meaning that if packets keep arriving in the high priority queue, the low priority queue will never be serviced. It has no guarantee that packets will ever be forwarded out of the low priority queue. And for most systems, this is undesirable. Here's an example of packet arrival times and departures. We see that a low priority packet arrives next, followed by a high priority packet. But since this all happens while the output link is busy, packet three gets sent before packet two. 
Fortunately for packet two, no more packets arrive before it's able to be sent. And later when the queues are empty, another low priority packet arrives and it's able to be sent right away. We also note that arriving high priority packets do not preempt an ongoing transmission of a low priority packet. An alternative to priority queuing is round robin scheduling. Again, we break up traffic by classes, but the output scheduler just takes one packet from each queue in turn. So this can be used to split the available service equally over multiple classes of traffic. A modification to round robin called weighted fair queuing enables us to combine the idea of priority and round robin scheduling. So in this case, each class has some weight WI and gets a weighted amount of service in each cycle. So while the high priority queue might get to send three packets and the medium priority queue send two packets and the low priority queue only send one packet within a given cycle, none of the classes will be starved completely like we saw with your priority queuing. This allows us to not just split the service amongst the three classes, but also makes a minimum bandwidth guarantee for each class of service. So we mentioned network neutrality a few slides back, and this is a good point to talk about it in a little more detail. We've talked about the available mechanisms where ISPs have many tools available to determine how they share their resources amongst the traffic that flows through them. So the question is, what are the motivations to choose one or another of these mechanisms? Some of the issues that come into play are those of free speech, capitalism and competition, encouraging innovation, and whether or not the ISP is considered an essential utility. There are also varying legal rules and policies that play into this, and these certainly vary from one jurisdiction to another at the country level and beyond. Network neutrality was a hot topic in news and politics about five years ago, and at that time in the United States, the FCC published an order specifying three rules the ISPs had to adhere to. One was that the ISPs could not prevent their customers from accessing lawful content on the internet. Another was that the ISP could not reduce the speed at which access was granted to particular applications on the internet. And the third was that the ISPs could not engage in paid prioritization. The background on this is that before this state in the United States, ISPs had been practicing these activities at large scale, either blocking or limiting access to particular websites and services on the internet from their own customers. And while ideally, an ISP customer that's not receiving the service that they pay for from their ISP would just choose a different ISP and thus let capitalism and competition work, in practice in the United States, 85% of ISP subscribers have only one option, so their ISP is effectively a monopoly. And so if their ISP decides to block or limit access to particular services, they are stuck with that. Another part of the network neutrality discussion became how to classify ISPs for regulatory reasons. Again, this is US centric related to FCC classifications. And the question is whether an ISP is a telecommunications service or an information service. These two labels make a significant difference in how the business would be regulated. And part of this goes back to laws enacted in the 1930s. A Title II common carrier is a telecommunications service which has specific duties and responsibilities relative to the public that it serves, whereas Title I information services are not regulated as common carriers by the FCC. That wraps up our discussion on what's inside a router, including our input and output ports, switching fabrics, buffering, drop policies, queuing and scheduling policies, and even a little bit about politics. In our next video, we'll move on to looking at the IP protocol itself, including the details about datagram formats and addressing. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.